Uh, Liza Marshall, who I'd sort of worked with before, uh, she sent me a book uh, called The King's Assassin by Benjamin Woolley. And I, I had heard things about James being gay, but or, you know, sleeping with men, because gay is not a term that they would have used. But the, the scale of it and the fact that he had these big love affairs and he would give young, attractive men all the power and sort of keys to the kingdom, essentially. And the fact that it was a, basically an open secret in English society, all the sort of power interests in England would push forward hot young men in front of James in order to try and manipulate him. It happened time and time again. So reading this book and re seeing the reality of that story was extraordinary. And then seeing this sort of mother and son, Mary and George, at the heart of it, and the way they rise from basically being commoners to being two of the most powerful people in Europe. That's an extraordinary story. So those two things really appealed. And then the third thing that really shone out from reading the book and you know, looking at the world around us is that those stories haven't been told. So the resistance to telling the story of James's court, both by historians and by artists as well, very few pieces of art or books have been written about it. Um, there's not big pieces of popular entertainment. We tend to look at the Tudors. We tend to look at, um, you know, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, or it's the Second World War. You know, <laughs> English history doesn't really focus on this era. And it's such a foundational period and such a foundational time. And it feels like because of James's love for men, it has been deliberately ignored. So there's a sort of, it's a rich, brilliant love story that hasn't been told and it hasn't been told for the wrong reasons. So it's like, great, like that's so much. And as a writer, you know, the dramatic possibilities of those stories is wild. So I, um, so yeah, from the reading the book, I knew I wanted to make it. Yeah, I think the thing is, we knew that we couldn't have a sort of Victorian buttoned up view of sexuality. This is a indulgent period led by a king who indulged his you know, he, he sort of his vices, if you like. And I think we knew that we couldn't be apologetic about the sex. Sex is at the centre of this court. Um, attraction is at the centre of this court. And I think as well, so we had to show it to be true to the spirit of the age. But we also had to do so carefully because what we're tracking through the sex scenes is transactions of power, but also transactions of intimacy and moments where transactional relationships actually become loving relationships. So through the sex in the show, through other like moments of intimacy, we're tracking where these characters are on their rise, how they're using their bodies, or how they're being used by someone else's body. So it felt like we couldn't shy away from it, but we had to do it carefully. And we did do it carefully. You know, there were intimacy coordinators, all our performers and directors have thought about how we represent it in a really you know, we, we don't want this to be a sort of cheap, lascivious show. We want to do some cheap, lascivious things because they're fun, but ultimately want it, we want it to be underscored with a, a, a coursing sense of investigating a love story. And that's what I think we're doing. Yeah, I think f um, the most unique thing of it is just her extraordinary body of work speaks for itself. Um, and she, when she enters or attaches herself to a project, it raises everyone's game. More people want to be involved. You get a better caliber of actor. Everyone on the cast and crew, they want to work on a Julia Moore project because she's so good. Um, and I think the key thing that she does is she makes everyone work harder as well. So on a set, you you know, you're, you're acting opposite her. You you have to bring your best game. Um, and then also she, with me and the, with the script, she was not afraid to say moments or lines where she thought maybe there's, there was a better way to do it. And I think I'm, I'm always really up for those conversations. And she did so in a way that was respectful to me in the writing, but occasionally if she thought something wasn't very good, she would tell me. And I think that's, that's the best way to work. So I would say, yeah, she, we wouldn't have made the show without her. We couldn't have made the show without her. And I think she's created something extraordinary in how she's brought Mary to life.